Hello, this is Jim Muller. Welcome to another sports medicine lecture. I hope you've enjoyed the topics so far. Today we're going to talk about the GI system. There are actually two lectures for this system. We will talk about the effects of exercise on the GI system in one lecture, and in the other we will talk about specific GI conditions that athletes face. As with all other lectures in my series, I have nothing to disclose, no conflicts of interest. Here's a list of the goals and objectives for the talks, um, looking at the physiologic effects of exercise on the GI system, common exercise-related upper and lower GI symptoms, discussing the risk factors for developing symptoms from exercise, and then understanding some of the common problems. So when we look at the effect of exercise on the GI system, we know that strenuous exercise will lead to increased gut permeability. This happens through a cascade of events. Norepinephrine is released, which binds to alpha adrenergic receptors of the sympathetic nervous system, causing splanchnic vasoconstriction. Increased splanchnic vascular resistance occurs as vascular resistance to other tissues associated with exercise, including the heart, lungs, and muscle, increases. Splanchnic blood flow can decrease by up to 80% after one hour of running at 70% of VO2 max. There is ischemia of the gut mucosa, which leads to epithelial injury. Epithelial injury is associated with apical erosion and likely dysfunction of all epithelial cell types, including enterocyte, goblet cells, pan cells, and endocrine cells. The increased permeability occurs due to either physical breaks in the epithelium, damaging the multi-protein complex of the tight junction, and or promoting dysfunction to tight junction regulatory proteins. All epithelial subtypes, once again, are damaged by hypoperfusion. Mature enterocytes release IFABP when injured, which may be a marker for epithelial injury during exercise. That's intestinal fatty acid binding protein, and these levels correlate with exercise-associated splanchnic hyperperfusion and subsequent ischemia, and may be a useful surrogate indicator of reductions in villous microvascular blood flow. Endurance running and cycling are associated with the greatest elevations of this binding protein. The greatest concentration of elevation has been observed when vigorous exercise was performed in hot ambient conditions. More recent studies have suggested that exercise duration may be a key contributing factor to the magnitude of exercise associated intestinal epithelial injury. This is a study from 2011, which looked at exercise-induced splanchnic hyperperfusion results in gut dysfunction in healthy men. In the study, healthy men cycled for 60 minutes at 70% of maximum workload capacity, and blood levels of intestinal FABP were measured every 10 minutes during exercise and for one hour after the completion of exercise. At baseline, the amount of binding protein in the blood was 309 picograms per milliliter, which increased to 615 picograms. This was of statistical significance. The levels declined substantially in the first 10 minutes after exercise and then gradually decreased further until baseline levels reached approximately one hour after cycling. The fact that there was no second peak indicates that reperfusion of the gut did not lead to greater injury. As I stated, permeability increases in proportion to the magnitude of exercise, but also it depends on the ambient temperature in which the exercise is being performed. It also increases with fluid restriction and dehydration. Dual sugar tests have been used to determine exercise-associated changes in intestinal permeability with the use of different sugars in different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. From these studies, it has been shown that most of the increased permeability happens in the small intestine. Here is an old but well-done study from 1997 looking at the effect of running intensity on intestinal permeability.
It's a classic study out of the University of Iowa that looked at small intestine permeability from exercise using rhamnose, a monosaccharide, and lactulose, a disaccharide, sugar ingested during the exercise event or at rest for the baseline test, then measured the amount of sugar recovered in the urine after exercise. Participants ran for 60 minutes on a treadmill at 40%, 60%, and 80% of VO2 max, and were fed the sugar load at 30 minutes of exercise. Ramnose is basically absorbed normally and should show up in the urine in the same amount regardless of any epithelial damage, where lactulose, the larger molecule, transverses the epithelia via a paracellular route through tight junctions due to damage caused by hyperperfusion. An increase in the lactulose to ramnose ratio expressed as a percent recovery of the ingested dose is interpreted as an increase in small intestinal permeability. In this first graph, the percent lactulose recovered after running at 80% was significantly higher than the percent recovered at rest with values of 0 0.28, 0 0.445, 0 0.381, and 0.564% respectively for the rest of the increased intensities. The second graph shows that there were no differences in percent ramnose recovered in each of the four trials. Therefore, the mean urinary excretion ratio of lactulose to ramnose was significantly elevated at 80% VO2 peak compared with the ratios at rest and 40 and 60%. All of this is consistent with increased small intestine permeability at higher intensity exercise. So we know that strenuous exercise leads to increased gut permeability due to epithelial damage. We also know that strenuous exercise leads to malabsorption through a chain of events. Norepinephrine binds to alpha adrenergic receptors of the sympathetic nervous system as we had discussed previously. This leads to sympathetic nervous system stimulation and slowed gastric emptying, as well as increased transit times. When motility issues lead to slowed gastric emptying and increased Oral sequel transit time are coupled with cellular damage due to hypoperfusion. Malabsorption occurs due to decreased function of nutrient transporters. So let's talk about the gastric emptying rate, which is impaired with higher intensity exercise. Moderate steady state exercise does not impair gastric emptying rate. Effects appear to be short lived. The oral sequel transit time is a little more difficult to understand. Short duration, less than 60 minutes of low to moderate exercise appears to promote motility where prolonged greater than 90 minute vigorous exercise may inhibit motility. This may be why you see such long lines outside the port johns at community sponsored short duration running events. Let's look at a study out of Australia looking at the effect of intermittent high intensity running on gastric emptying of fluids in men. This study was published in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise in 2005. And it looked at the effect of variable intensity shuttle running on gastric emptying of a carbohydrate free placebo drink and of a 6.4% carbohydrate electrolyte sports drink. The investigators compared the volume of test drink emptied during two 15-minute periods of walking exercise with that of two 15-minute periods of a specific shuttle test that's abbreviated as the LIST test. There was a walking trial after the placebo drink, a walking trial after the carbohydrate drink, the LIST trial with the placebo drink, and the LIST trial with the carbohydrate drink and gastric emptying was measured on the four trials using a double sampling aspiration technique in the eight healthy males who were brave enough to volunteer. During the initial 15 minutes of exercise, gastric emptying was significantly less in the LIST trial compared to the walking trial. During the second 15 minutes of exercise, similar volume of test drinks were emptied on all trials. Over the 30 minutes of each trial, the exercise intensity of the LIST trial caused reduced emptying for both types of fluid ingested compared to the walking trial, and the differences were statistically significant. The conclusions drawn were that exercise intensity of the shuttle test 
was sufficient to slow gastric emptying of carbohydrate and non-carbohydrate drinks with uh, comparison to walking, and the type of fluid didn't really matter. So we'll just walk ourselves, no pun intended, through the second trial, which again shows similarities across the board, and then the final trial that showed that the shuttle run significantly reduced gastric emptying compared to the walking trial. When discussing orocecal transit time, there are a number of studies that we could look at which all show a slowing of the transit time. In the top study on this slide by Van Neuenhoven, both symptomatic and asymptomatic athletes were tested, and it showed that after 90 minutes of cycling and running at 70% of maximal power, the transit time was decreased greater by the running trial compared to the cycling trial. In the Cato study, a cycle ergometer test was used to examine the effect of moderate intensity exercise on orocecal transit time. In this study, there was a 120% increase in myoelectric activity due to 20 minutes of supine cycling at 60 watts showing that the enhanced amplitude of gastric myoelectric activity can be induced by moderate intensity exercise itself. Finally, a study using pH telemetry in athletes with GI symptoms showed that small bowel and colon transit times are similar at rest and with exercise in GI asymptomatic and symptomatic athletes. So exercise and malabsorption is certainly an important consideration. The competent functioning of nutrient transporters on intestinal enterocytes during exercise is important for achieving nutrient intake requirements during prolonged exercise and avoiding the occurrences of GI symptoms arising from nutrient malabsorption, as well as aiding post-exercise nutrient absorption that can optimize recovery processes. Transporter activity is reduced at higher intensity exercise compared to moderate exercise and rest conditions. Carbohydrate malabsorption is reduced more by high-intensity running than high-intensity cycling, similar to what we've seen in prior discussions. Breath hydrogen excretion after consumption of glucose and or fructose that is normally absorbed is one way to measure carbohydrate malabsorption. The problem is that increased ventilation rate with exercise can make H2 measurement difficult to interpret. Post-exercise values taken when respiratory rate returns to resting levels may be a more accurate measure of nutrient malabsorption. The study cited here by Lang showed that running at high intensity significantly reduces glucose absorption compared to moderate and light exercise. This was studied on eight trained runners performing a one-hour resting experiment and three one-hour treadmill experiments at 30, 50, or 70 percent of VO2 max in a thermoneutral environment. Subjects ingested two non-metabolizing glucose analogs prior to exercise and during the following five hours all urine was collected and the amount of the sugars was determined to come up with these conclusions. In the Van Wick study it was shown that protein and malabsorption also occurs. Let's talk a little bit about exercise associated GI symptoms. This is a study out of Australia that looked at 54 multi-stage ultramarathoners and 22 continuous 24-hour ultramarathoners. In the graph that you see here we're looking at the percentage of athletes from a multi-stage ultramarathon who reported GI symptoms divided out by stage. You can see that nausea and the urge to vomit were the top symptoms encountered regardless of the stage of the multi-stage ultramarathon. In all, GI symptoms were reported by 85% of the multi-stage ultramarathoners. It was also noted in the multi-stage marathoners that 
there was a reduced total daily, during, and post-stage energy and macronutrient, macro, macronutrient intake looking at the continuous 24-hour ultramarathoners, you can see again that nausea and the urge to vomit were the top symptoms encountered. In this group, 73% of the participants had some type of GI symptoms. It was noted that nutritional intake variables did not change in the 24-hour continuous ultramarathoners. The conclusion was that GI symptoms during ultramarathon are extremely common and GI symptoms during the multi-stage event, but not the 24-hour race, will compromise nutritional intake. Now let's take a look at gastrointestinal symptoms of marathon runners. This is an off-sited report out of the Oregon Health Services University published in 1984. It was a survey study of marathon participants from a single marathon in 1982. The survey asked the participants about GI symptoms experienced during runs, both an easy or a hard run, and after finishing a run, not specifically the marathon, it could have been after a training run. So they were just asking about the regularity of symptoms after running. Questions asked uh, included both upper and lower GI symptom questions. There were 707 respondents, most of whom were male, with a mean age of 35 years. The first chart that you see here looks at the upper GI symptoms, which were not exceedingly common. Heartburn was equally common during an easy run or a hard run, but not typically present after a run had been completed. Nausea was much more common during a hard run or upon completion of a run. Lower GI symptoms, on the other hand, were much more common than upper GI symptoms. Here's information from a 1988 study from the British Journal of Sports Medicine with methods similar to the prior study looking at gastrointestinal disturbances in marathon runners. Again, we'll start with upper GI symptoms where it was found that loss of appetite was the most common symptom. This was not a question asked in the Oregon study. Again, you can see that heartburn is fairly steady across the easy run, hard run, and post run questioning, where nausea is much more common during a hard run or after a run has been completed. Again, vomiting is very low likelihood. When we look at the lower GI symptoms, again, these were much more common than the upper GI symptoms, as you can see here. Again, the participants in the study were through survey and most were male. So when we talk about exercise associated GI symptoms, we have to think about the duration of exercise. It is one of the leading risk factors for developing symptoms. We just looked at several studies looking at multi-stage ultramarathon, 24 hour ultramarathon continuous, and marathon runners. And as you noted, the percentage of athletes with GI complaints was much higher in the longer events. In fact, 96% of those competing in a 161K run will uh, have experienced GI problems according to one study. 85% in the multi-stage ultramarathon and 73% in the 24-hour continuous marathon, as we already mentioned in contrast to only 11% and 7% of endurance runners who had completed a half marathon and marathon respectively reporting gastrointestinal symptoms. What about other risk factors? The type of exercise is certainly important. Running repeatedly has been shown to promote greater incidence and severity of GI symptoms compared to other modes of exercise. Ambient temperature is important with higher incidence and severity of GI symptoms in hot ambient conditions that's greater than 30 degrees centigrade compared to those reported in cold to thermoneutral ambient conditions. Women are more prone to exercise associated GI symptoms than men, and this has been demonstrated in multiple studies. 
some of the most recent studies we looked at had mostly men included in the surveys. And so the numbers may have been even higher if more women had responded. History of recurrent exercise associated GI symptoms is another risk factor. Individuals with this type of history appear to suffer greater incidence and severity of symptoms during exercise, suggesting some degree of predisposition. Finally, feeding during exercise at a time when the GI tract is compromised may be a risk factor. During a gut challenge protocol, 100% of participants suffered from mild symptoms and 52% suffered severe symptoms when challenged with 90 gram per hour carbohydrate during running at 60% VO2 max in thermoneutral ambient conditions in which euhydration was maintained throughout. So feeding during the exercise may also be a risk factor. Looking back at the two previous studies we've already discussed that examined marathon runners by survey, when you compare genders, females were much more likely to experience symptoms during an easy run as well as during a hard run. And again, this could be a training run or a race of any distance. When you look at symptoms after running had been completed, again, the females were much more likely to experience symptoms. Now, this was the data from the Oregon study. When you go back to looking at the Irish paper published in British Journal of Sport Medicine, again, females showed a much greater likelihood of experiencing symptoms during an easy run, during a hard run, and post-run. Now, those were lower GI symptoms. What about the upper GI symptoms? You can see that men experienced heartburn at a higher percentage and maybe a slightly higher percentage of loss of appetite during easy runs. During hard runs, it was roughly equal with regards to heartburn but the upper GI symptoms of nausea and vomiting were much more common in females, loss of appetite being more common in males. And in the post-run situation, uh, again, females usually experienced more upper GI symptoms than the males. So let's look at some specific upper GI issues that may occur. GERD, nausea and vomiting, gastritis, upper GI bleed, and exercise-related transient abdominal pain are all common upper GI ailments in running athletes. The exact ideology of these issues due to exercise is not known in some cases, such as nausea and vomiting, and are probably multifactorial. GERD is the most common cause of GI symptoms during sport. During exercise, lower esophageal sphincter tone is diminished and esophageal motility is, in, is decreased, which can lead to GERD symptoms. Risk factors include high intensity exercise, endurance sports, postprandial exercise, and increased intra-abdominal pressure with activities such as weightlifting during the Valsalva technique or in cycling due to the bent over riding position. Here's a study published in 2003 that looked at runners, cyclists, and weightlifters, 10 subjects from each sport with three-month history of exercise-induced heartburn were enrolled. Subjects underwent evaluation of fasting and fed esophageal pH, among other tests. And then esophageal pH was measured to see what percentage of time they spent with the pH in the acid reflux range, which was less than four. In all cases, the percentage of time spent in GERD-associated acid content in, in the esophagus increased with exercise. In runners, it increased significantly. In cyclists, it increased only slightly. And in weightlifters, it increased significantly as well. Weightlifters experienced the most heartburn and reflux, 
18.5% of the time their esophageal pH was less than four in a fasted state and 35.8% of the time in the fed state, it was concluded that strenuous exercise induces significant reflux and related symptoms, even in conditioned athletes. Looking at gastritis and upper GI bleed, contributing factors include the reduced splanchnic blood flow, mechanical trauma, and the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We've already discussed the causes and effects of reduced splanchnic blood flow. Mechanical trauma from certain sports, particularly repetitive trauma, such as running, makes intuitive sense. But what about NSAIDs? You can see from the studies listed here that the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in athletes is exceedingly common. It has also been well documented that upper GI lesions due to the use of anti-inflammatory medication, is there anything that can be done about it? Here is a study that looked at long distance runners 24 of them, 16 of whom were male, 8 were female, at an average age of 18 years, who had symptoms of GI issues, as you can see here. Aside from the symptom questionnaire, stool hemocult testing and upper GI endoscopy was performed, showing that 22 of the 24 runners had at least one upper GI mucosal lesion at the onset of the study. They were then given ranitidine, to see if this would help reduce the number of lesions seen. Here is a list of the lesions that were found at initial endoscopy with several patients having more than one finding. Subjects then took oral ranitidine, 150 milligrams BID for two weeks, and upper GI endoscopy and stool hemocult tests were repeated after the treatment. The results were that the endoscopic improvements were seen in 11 of the 14 cases of erosive gastritis and four of the five cases of esophagitis. Six subjects were hemocult positive prior to the study with only one being positive after the medication. The conclusion was that gastric mucosal lesions and GI bleeding in long distance runners seem to be associated to acid related factors mediated by the high level of regular running and that ranitidine may be helpful in treating and preventing gastric mucosal lesions. Let's talk about exercise-related transient abdominal pain. It's estimated that 60% of distance runners will experience an episode of transient abdominal pain annually. Risk factors include being a new runner, a recent increase in training, being female, and it's more common in 10K versus marathon runners at the same event. It could be that 10K runners at those events were more novice than the marathoners, which would again make them a newer runner. So it may actually be the same risk factor. The exact ideology of exercise-related transient abdominal pain is unknown. Theories include diaphragmatic ischemia, stress on subdiaphragmatic ligaments, and irritation of the parietal peritoneum. Contradictory evidence exists for each of the ideologic theories I just mentioned. Abdominal wall muscle spasm has been disproven by EMG studies. There is no proven treatment or preventive strategies. The nice news is that transient related abdominal pain is not dangerous. What about lower GI issues? Things like lower GI bleeding, cecal slap, ischemic colitis, and what's known as the trots. Here's a study out of the United States published in 2018 on gastrointestinal bleeding following a long distance cycling race. In the heat, this study investigated the incidence of GI bleeding during a non-impact prolonged race in the heat. This was a 161K cycling event. 25 experienced cyclists completed a summer 161K cycling event and following the race, they were given a fecal occult blood test and were instructed to retrieve their first bowel movement for 
examination. Two of the 25, or 8 percent, produced positive results for the fecal occult blood, while an additional two, a total of 16 percent, experienced constipation, heart stools, diarrhea, or vomiting. The conclusion was that these data show a low incidence of GI complaints and occult bleeding during prolonged cycling event in the heat, indicating that low impact exercise such as cycling may lessen some of the occult GI bleeding previously reported in distance running in the heat. This is very different from the information found in distance running, which we have already discussed. Which we have already discussed. Now, here is a study out of Austria. Let me go back, I'm sorry. We'll just run ahead on that slide again. A study out of Austria, which was published in 2006, and Fallman looked at ultramarathoners. This is a 246K race um, to see if the use of a pre-race proton pump inhibitor could reduce the likelihood of GI bleeding. Uh, it was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study. The control group included 17 runners, and the study group included 20 runners who received three days of an oral proton pump inhibitor. Of the 17 control group athletes, 12 of them experienced GI bleed after the ultramarathon, whereas in the study group, only 2 of 20, 10%, had GI bleeding for a statistically significant reduction in GI bleeding. The conclusion was that a short-term prophylactic regimen of an oral proton pump inhibitor can... Let's talk about cecal slap. This is a repetitive mechanical trauma as the cecum strikes the anterior abdominal wall during running. Surgical studies of patients with right lower quadrant pain showed that approximately 17% of them have a mobile cecum. The mechanical trauma can lead to bleeding, so this is basically a bruise of the cecum as it bashes back and forth against the anterior abdominal wall. The first case report I could find of this was published in 1982. Ischemic colitis presents as abdominal pain and frank blood in the stool. From an athlete perspective, it is most common in long distance runners, but the true incidence is unknown. We've already talked about the changes in the splanchnic circulation and how that can lead to damage. And this is the extreme result of changes in the large intestine. CT findings in ischemic colitis include wall thickening with heterogeneous enhancement and areas of low attenuation consistent with edema, enhancement of the mucosa, loss of colonic haustra, shaggy contour, and various degrees of pericolonic streakiness. This CT shows diffuse wall thickening of the cecum and ascending colon as marked by the white arrows. Treatment is generally supportive with bowel rest. That should say bowel, not bow. It's not a person. IV fluids and pain medications. Let's talk about the trots. This is basically exercise-related diarrhea, the exact cause of which is unknown, or although there may be multiple contributing factors, as you can see listed here. It is more common with high-intensity runs and also more common on competition days than on training days. So again, stress and anxiety may play a role. Prevention includes reduction of fiber intake and avoidance of sweeteners for 24 hours before the run. Immediately before the run, trying to limit or avoid caffeine, as well as limiting or avoiding high fat content foods. Proper hydration is important for prevention. And people should take caution with the use of energy gels and, and energy bars. Also, they should avoid pre-run non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So let's recap briefly here. Exercise reduces GI blood flow, which may cause direct cellular injury and changes in gut transit and absorption via sympathetic nerve stimulation. 
Upper and lower GI symptoms are common in athletes, especially in high-intensity runners participating in endurance events. Most exercise-related GI symptoms are short-lived and resolve spontaneously, and NSAID use is extremely common in athletes and may contribute to exercise-related GI symptoms. And with that, we'll end today's discussion. Please keep your eye out for the next in the series of GI problems in athletes. Thank you for your attention.